thanks again for coming. We want to, to jump right in, so we'll turn the time over to Claudia Nischwitz, who's going to be doing a presentation on drone use and agriculture using some of the experiences that she's had um, with the drone that she's acquired and some of the research she's done with that. So Claudia, we'll turn the time over to you if you want to share your screen. Okay. I will do that. Let's see if that works. So I just be talking a little bit about application examples that you can use for UAVs in agriculture. I started about five years ago using just to see what you can do with it. A lot of the growers asked what they could use it. They saw them at ag exhibits and they bought one and now they had a drone and didn't know what they could do with it. So I had some friends from Ari University of Arizona come up that did already a lot of work with drones and we just tried to see anything you could do with it in the field. And since I'm a plant pathologist, I was mostly interested in plant diseases, but we tried a, a few other things as well, including um, to see if you can count cattle with a drone. Uh, a rancher had asked us, and so we went out there and it did not work quite as well as the rancher had hoped. The cattle did not like the sound of the drone because it sounded similar to a, a bunch of buzzing bees. But if you can get your cows or other livestock used to it, it might work. So first, I want to talk about a few things that sh you should consider when you want to use it in agriculture. If you use it on your commercial farm, you actually need to get a commercial operator's license to use your drone. You can't just fly it under a recreational use. So you're gonna have to take a test as a commercial operator. Your drone needs to be registered with the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. And then you need to mark the drone on the outside with the, your registration identification. So in case the drone disappears and it's found or it crashes somewhere that they can find out who that drone belonged to. The registration is very easy. You just go to the FAA website and, and fill in a form and it costs a few dollars. It's not very expensive and it, it's valid for three years and then you can renew it. You should also download on your iPad or your iPhone or other phone, whatever you use to fly the drone, the before you fly app. It shows you flight restrictions around the location where you're at. Or you can also check if you want to go to a field that's 10 miles away, you could put that location in and see if there's any flight restrictions. The no fly zones are usually five miles around airports, military bases, some helipads of hospitals and things like that. So you can check on that as well. If your fields are in a no-fly zone, you would have to apply for an authorization to fly on a specific day at a specific time through the LANS program. That's the low altitude authorization and notification capability. And you can go to that website and um, put in your information and then you would get uh, almost in real time. That's at least what they say. I have never tried it since the fields that I fly are not in a no-fly zone. You would get either real-time permission that you can fly or they would just say no. And I have heard from some people that have applied for using it in no-fly zones and they were denied. Or if the area has a no-fly zone, but it's not listed on the LANS system, you can go to the FAA drone zone and apply for a flying permit there. You also want to check the FAA website frequently for new regulations. There's also always things that are changing and new rules and regulations come up, so you always want to stay up to date. And depending on the drone that you have, it may require internet or Wi-Fi availability in the field so that the company can keep track of where your drone is. A few other things to consider is if your fields 
have power lines or equipment in the field at the time of flight. Tractors and power lines can interfere with the signal to your drone. You might lose the image or you might lose control of the drone in the worst case. Um, the type of drone that you want to use can be something to consider. There are cheaper drones that have built-in cameras that work really well and take great pictures. And then there's more expensive drones with prices being almost unlimited that you could put on a near-infrared camera or a light camera if you want to use near-infrared or both. And they're more expensive, but they might give you a few more additional options. The crops that you want to fly over is an important consideration. There are some crops, crops it works great, and you'll see some examples of those later. There's other crops where it doesn't work. So if you have an onion field, for example, with the onions being very small, they're like a straight stick up and you look straight down with your drone. So you, your field will look like there's nothing in it because it can't detect the drone, the, the onions. Also, you know, what cameras do you want to use? As I mentioned, some of the cheaper drones, they have a built-in light camera, but you can't change the camera to a near-infrared camera. More expensive drones, you often have the option of buying several different types of cameras that you want to use. Do you want to use still images or a movie? If you take still images, you just, you can take a lot of images in a field and stitch them together later with some software. Or you can fly a continuous stretch over your, your field as a movie and then look at it later for evaluation. Another important consideration is programmed or manual flight control. I prefer manual flight control to, just because then I know if something happens and I need to land a drone quickly, I could. I had some birds try to dive bomb the drone and then I could at least land it right away without having to worry about the bird being injured, hitting the drone or the drone crashing because the bird hit it. If you want to use programmed flight, you should practice or try it out in a field where there's nothing around you for quite a ways because you need to figure out how your drone responds to a variety of different scenarios. So for example, if you program your drone with GPS coordinates for a field and all of a sudden the battery runs low, low the drone will either fly home on its own and fly home could be the spot where it started from. But if they're between the location where the drone is at that point in time and home, if there's a tree in between, it will hit that tree. The drone does not have the capability to avoid obstacles that are in its way. Or some drones, when the battery runs low, they will just land straight down wherever they are at that moment. And if they're above a tree, they will land in the tree. If they're above a power line, they will land in the power line. So it's, it's important to know what your drone would do if you use programmed flight. And I've heard from some growers that use programmed flight and the, there was a house in between and the drone hit the house wall. It was their own house, but the drone was still damaged beyond repair. And I had somebody else say they fl flew over an orchard and the drone just vanished. They never found it. A few general suggestions for disease detection in vegetables, which is my main um, focus, as well as field crops, cut flowers, anything you want to fly 15 to 30 feet at the most, because if you fly higher, you're not going to see any disease problems in the field anymore. If you want to stitch the images together, they need to overlap by at least 50%. And then you get like one big overview of the field and you can pinpoint where there's problems that you want to investigate closer. 
If you do take a video, the speed should be five miles or less. At least that's what we found using our drone. Otherwise, your images get very grainy and blurry. And then timing of the flight can help to reduce shade problems. That's especially if you fly over trees. So if you look here, this is a tart cherry orchard with a near infrared camera. You can see the dead trees, but you also have a lot of shadows that make it a little bit difficult to see. So we flew that at about 10 o'clock in the morning. If we had waited until noon, until the sun was high in the sky, we probably would have had less, less shade. Now I'm gonna talk about a few specific examples of various things that you can do with the drone. So you can detect disease plants, and then you could contact your extension personnel or crop consultant for identification of what the problem is and what management options you have. So that might be easier, especially if you don't have a lot of personnel that could scout a field. If you can fly your drone and you see something that looks unusual, you can then go straight to these plants and collect a sample and, and get it identified. And it could help you minimize the spread and yield loss because you're detected earlier. So one of the examples is Liberibacter. It's a non-culturable um, bacterium that's transmitted by insects. And you get a random distribution in a field. And the example that I have are pepper plants that are very stunted and they will produce no marketable fruit. So if you look here, this. These are pepper plants. These are the normal size plants like this one here. And I don't know if you can see the cursor, but, um, and then the one in the circle, that's the infected plant. And that's this tiny dot that's right here in the middle between these healthy plants. There's two more infected plants right down here that you can see the picture of them on the side here. So if you fly your drone and you see these kind of discrepancies, then you can go to these plants and, and take a look what the problem is. Another um, disease that we found the drone very useful was wheat mosaic virus, also known as high plains virus in sweet corn. At the time of the flight, the plants were about four weeks old and for corn that can play a important role because as the plants get taller, they cover up potentially diseased stunted plants and you might not see them. The virus is normally transmitted by wheat curl mites, but it can be seed borne, but usually that was considered to be a very rare occurrence. The symptoms in corn consist of white to chlorotic streaking on the leaves and they're frequently stunted plants if they're infected early in the season. And the early infected plants in that particular field, they never got more than a foot tall. So we used a near infrared camera in that case because it makes all the green leaf tissue turn red, but the white and chlorotic streaks on the leaves actually stayed white and chlorotic. And you could also see the poor germination in the field. So this was the field, that was the images that were stitched together by my friends from the University of Arizona. This was taken up here in Logan on a farm. And so we just zoomed in on this small area here and you see the individual corn plants. And then if you look closer, you can see that those leaves here and down here, they're all having white areas. So we went back there to these specific plants and looked at them closer and you can see the chlorosis on these leaves. Let's see, there's another one here. So when we, let me get back all the way up here. So if you look here, this pattern where these plants are just scattered across the field indicates that this is not at this point an insect transmitted disease, at least not with the weed curl mites. If the weed curl mites would be there, you would have patches of plants that would all be infected. So we were wondering if it could have been seed borne at the time. And so we did some testing and we 
they determined that it was seedborne. And so the drone was very useful in, in demonstrating that. Let's see, I'm sorry, got a pick through there again. This was um, cauliflower. And that early on in the season, there was some pythium root rot in the ground and it infected some of the cauliflower plants. And you can see those dead wilted plants very easily flying with a near infrared, uh, with a light camera over the field. This is curly top, a uh, it's a virus transmitted by beet leaf hoppers. And you can see individual infected plants. We tested those plants, so we knew it was beet curly top. You might just go to the field and see these wilting plants, but you, again, it saves you time if you can fly your drone once a week rather than having to walk up and, up and down each row to get to your plants to see if there's something wrong. Now here on the left, you see eggplants that are infected with verticillium wilt, and you can see the necrosis and dieback on these leaves that was flown at about 20 feet elevation. And so that was, again, something that was very useful to find out. And on the side, if you look here, these weeds, you, can, you, you could use the drone and fly it over a field and pick out areas where you have a weed problem. So you could send your crew specifically to those areas in a big field for weeding. Now, powdery mildew was kind of disappointing. I was hoping that you would be able to see the white spots earlier as soon as the first white spots would show up on these leaves and that did not turn out to be the case. So this picture was taken a week before this one was, the second one was taken. And if you walk through, you could see the initial white spots that were starting to develop, but they do not show up in the drone image. You only see the powdery mildew once the leaves are completely covered. At that point, it's too late to apply any fungicides because the powdery mildew has just gone too far. You need to spray it as soon as the first white spots um, show up. So that was a little bit disappointing, but uh, that was the whole purpose of the, the project was to determine what you can use it for and what you couldn't use it for. Then Ben and I flew over a pistachio orchard that had some trees dying back and we were trying to see if there was anything we could determine. So you see that there's trees missing over here. And if you look overall at this picture, it seems that the soil has a lighter color in the area where a lot of the trees are dead versus some of the area where the trees look fine. And so we're still trying to figure out if there's a different soil type that could affect the trees, if there's any salt or anything else that um, could cause a problem. So in that case, a drone can be very useful just to get an overview of where all these dead trees are. This was flown at about 100 feet elevation. And then you can, again, go back to these individual spots and do more detecting and see what you can figure out. We could not find a disease on these trees. That's why we decided to see if there's any like environmental abiotic soil or water related problems. You can use your drone for yield estimates and detection of planting problems in some cases. So for example, if you take um, peppers again, you get about five to seven pepper um, fruit per plant. And if you have two rows of peppers per bed, you can calculate how many boxes you could get theoretically depending on the size of the, of the plants and the size of the bell peppers and how many plants you need to fill up a box. And then you can calculate that for your acreage depending on the site, the planting space that you're using. So this was a pepper field that my friends from Arizona flew down here in, in Utah. And we'll just focus on that small area here, but you can see just looking at the overview of this field that there's areas where there's plants missing. So if you zoom in here in this stretch, 
there's about 30 plants missing. And that would be something if you flew over that area once it had been planted, a few days after it had been planted, you would notice that there's these gaps in the field and you could send a crew in and have them plant the missing peppers. So if you want to estimate a yield loss for those 30 plants that are missing, there's about 150 to 200 bell peppers that you lost. Depending on the pepper size and the number of the fruits per plant, you lost about one and a half to four and a half boxes in just that one small area. So if you extrapolate that for the entire field, that can add up pretty quick. So a drone can be very useful in that case to find gaps early in the season that you could still fill in. You can also detect different soil types. So this is a potato field. And the grower was saying that the potatoes on this side always looked a lot greener than the same variety of potatoes on this side. And it's not very obvious when you're in the field. We only noticed that after we flew the drone that the soil here was a lot lighter than on this side. And so we had the soil analyzed and it turned out that this was more of a sandy soil. And on this side, there was more loam in it. So that was kind of an interesting find. You can detect herbicide damage. Uh, this is some celery that was ex accidentally exposed to herbicide. And we flew it with both the near infrared camera as well as the light camera. And you can see it pretty well. So this is the healthy celery that was not exposed. And this is the celery that was exposed. And you can see the chlorosis on the leaves and the stunting of the plants in, in both cases. You can detect nutrient or water problems. This was a trial I had at the Casewell Research Farm. And we decided to just fly the drone over it and see what happens. And we noticed that this is where the drip line started, that the plants at the upper half of their field where the drip line was, were a lot more vigorous than the plants at the end of the drip line. When we look closer, the water pressure just never was high enough to make it to the end of the line. So the plants never really got a lot of water or nutrients. So they were a lot smaller. So that would be another thing you could use your drone for. Also, if you use flood irrigation, you can use the drone to see if you get even water distribution. Here you can see where the soil is already dry and where it's still wet. So that could help you determine if you need to irrigate again or if there's too much water still in the field. You could also see if water pools somewhere in your field. You can see that there's still a lot of puddles at the end of this field. And if you have a lot of puddles, again, from the plant disease standpoint, you might have more problems with soilborne plant diseases. Now, nutrient problems. This is a, a trial from a colleague, those are dahlias, and she applies different nitrogen rates. And you can see very easily that the plants that did not get any supplemental nitrogen are a lot smaller than the ones that got an additional 200 pounds of nitrogen during the growing season. And this is just a small trial, but if you had a large field, it would allow you to also see if there was any problems in some sections of your field with nutrients or if everything looked fine. You can also detect nutrient deficiencies on plants. These are raspberries that have a micronutrient deficiency, iron, zinc, or manganese. And you can see those white chlorotic leaves very easily. They almost stick out like a sore thumb when you kind of look at all the other raspberries. So that was just that one plant. And so at the end, I just want to acknowledge the funding agencies that provided funding for this project, USU Extension Grant and the USDA Specialty Crop Block Grant. Rosa Bevington and Kurt Nolte, they came up from Arizona and 
taught me and my students how to fly the drone and the growers who let us use their fields and the undergrad students in my lab that helped with all the testing as well as the flying of the drones. So a couple of things I might want to add that I forgot to mention initially under the consideration. You always need to keep that drone in your um, within your eyesight. You can't have somebody go quarter mile down the road and watch the drone and you don't see it anymore when you're the one flying it. So somebody has to have constantly sight of that drone. And that's the person who flies the drone or you have to have a spotter that's standing next to you. They can't be standing anywhere else. So you could not use it to see, to fly it over a hill to see if there was still water in a trough for your cattle. That would not be accessible, acceptable. You also cannot fly it above 400 feet in a, an unrestricted airspace. If you want to fly it higher, you would have to get special permission. And I did not mention um, pesticide applications with drones. There are, is research done at some universities on that, especially applications for insecticides. But the problem that they um, encountered from what I've heard so far is that the weight limit for a drone is 55 pounds. And if you have a, a spray tank underneath, you can easily exceed that. So at that point, that's the limit that you can use. And so it might not be functional at the moment. 